Well, what is up, Rise 2020? Are you guys excited to be in your last session? I am so pumped to be here with you today. And that's not just because I've had two and a half grande blonde roasts and I'm a little shaky from all of the caffeine and sort of feel like maybe my stomach's a little upset from all the coffee. So we're gonna get through this together. But I am so, so thrilled to be here with all of you here at 48th Street this morning, with everybody joining us in Kirksville, everybody joining us in Macomb, and especially all of you ladies who are joining us from your homes, with your small groups, wherever you are joining us from this morning, I just want you to know that God has something for you today. And I know that. This is not in my notes. I know that he has something for you today because as I was preparing, I took out a lot of stuff from my notes. And the stuff that I took out of my notes, I heard Megan say last night, and I heard Rebecca say just a little while ago. And I, I can't tell you how cool of a feeling that was because I am convinced that God has something important he is doing in your life today. And so as we get started in this session, I want you to take a moment and just internally open your heart, be ready to receive what it is God has for you this morning, because I am convinced that you are going to walk out different today. And I know that not just because I feel it in my own spirit, but I know that because every time we interact with Scripture, and we invite God into our life to change us, that he is faithful and he does that. And I just wanted to start this morning by giving you that encouragement. And I know, like everybody else up here has said, that we need some encouragement in 2020, that it has been a long year. And you know, I think Rebecca is a little bit more optimistic than I am, because she's like, you know, we're almost there, we're almost done, and I'm like, we got two more months left in 2020. Like there is a lot of time for a lot of really crazy catastrophic things to happen. Like we haven't had an alien invasion yet. Uh, we haven't had any sea monsters coming up out of the Atlantic Ocean yet. Um, we ha I don't think that there have been any volcanoes explode this year. And like, you know, they've been talking about this thing in um, Yellowstone that like could be this super volcano, like maybe, I'm like, I don't know, maybe 2020 is the year that that happens. Uh, Santa hasn't been caught with any missing ballots. I'm definitely counting on that one happening sometime in the next few weeks. So just mark that down. I got that one right. It has been a crazy year. And I think that we are all sick of hearing about how crazy it has been. Because we would prefer, we would prefer to distract ourselves with something else. I know that during, during this year, as, we've try, as I've tried to like look on the bright side of things, um, I did what everybody else did. I uh, made whipped coffee. I tried to make a sourdough starter. I did actually pick up running, um, and then I, uh, you know, if you're a distance runner, you know that there are some things that happen when you run a long time and you don't plan for a bathroom stop, and it is a little bit embarrassing. Uh, had to encounter some of those things and maybe backed off the running a little bit. We have looked for things to distract us from the chaos that we're experiencing because it is really hard, because it has been a really tough year. And last night when I went home after hearing Megan speak, I, for the first time, felt really light. Like I felt like, like I felt like some sort of life had been breathed into me. And I know that's because the scripture that she spoke over us. But sometimes we need more than just a nice distraction. Megan talked about it and she said, we don't need to just live off of the Jesus high. We need to fill up our arsenal with the truth of scripture so that we can be prepared to fight the battles that we know are ahead. And Rebecca echoed a similar sentiment this morning too, and that is what I wanna do this morning. So I am not going to give you a distraction to take your mind off of what is happening at home. I am going to give you a tool for your arsenal to get you through it. So this morning, we are going to face head on what it is that's going on in your life right now. Because I know that in addition to a global pandemic and economic schizophrenia, 
and unbelievably contentious conversations about racial reconciliation that we have needed to have for a long time. And uh, amid crazy travel crisis, I know that in your life, there's been cancer diagnosis, there's been divorce, there's been infidelity, there's been miscarriage and infertility, there's been unemployment, there's been financial crisis that you have felt on a personal level, there's been eviction, there's been despair, and there's been death. I know that that's happening in your life because I know that I have personally heard about it just this week, all of those things. And so I know that we are all in a heavy season because we are all experiencing some level of collective chaos. But at the same time, I know that each one of us has our own individual crises that are happening. And I believe that God wants you to better understand how to go through that. Rebecca shared this morning about how we, in James 1, that we should be encouraged in our trials because we know that they produce perseverance. And I know that. And Megan shared last night all of the scripture about how important it is that we commit ourselves to God's word because it will get us through those times. And I know that. I know that in my head. I know that God loves me. I know that he is my deliverer. I know that he cares for me. I know that he is always with me. I know that he ultimately is good and has good in mind and in plan for me. I know that my salvation rests in him and not in myself. I know these things in my head. And I've been a committed believer for 17 years, and I have walked with Jesus and committed myself to learning his scriptures and studying his word and being in community. But it's still been a really tough year. And not just because of the things that are happening on the news, but because of the things that are happening in my heart and in my house and in my family. And it's just been really hard. And I don't think I'm alone in that because I don't think that you could have lived on planet Earth for any amount of time without experiencing trial and hardship. And so today, we are gonna look at a story that I believe is not only gonna encourage you, but it's also going to equip you with the tools that you need to navigate what it is that you're experiencing right now. And if you're not experiencing it right now, it's something that I know you will experience someday because we look at scripture and we know that we can expect trials and persecution and trouble and hardship. We know that we can anticipate that. And so we should not be surprised when it happens. We should be prepared. And that is what I want to do with you this morning, is for us to work together to be prepared for whatever it is that God has next for us. So we're gonna take a look at a story in, cha in John chapter 11. And in this story, <laughs> we see an interaction between Jesus and three people who he had a deeply committed loving relationship with. And I think that this demonstrates for us how we can take what we know is true about God up here, what we have learned in scripture, what we have heard at women's conference and at church, and how we can allow that to transform the way that we interact with our trauma and the way that we interact with our trials. Because sometimes I think, I know for me, I, I don't know if this is how it's true in your life. Sometimes I will hear scripture like James 1, and I'll think that the perseverance is just a silver lining to the cloud of whatever it is I'm going through. And I'm like, okay, it's just a silver lining. But God is not a God of silver linings. He does not give us promises as silver linings. He's the whole cloud. He is with us in that valley. He is with us through the whole thing. And there are things that he wants to teach us in the midst of that. And we see this happening in John 11. John 11 verses one through three say, now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. It was cool that Rebecca shared that story because I knew that I was gonna talk about the second part of it. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, 
the one you love is sick. So let me just back up a second and give you a little bit of context for who Mary and Martha were. Most of the time when you hear about Martha and Mary, it's in the context of a story in the book of Luke. And in that story, Jesus is hanging out at Mary and Martha's house, and Martha is busying herself with all the work. She's making sure everybody's got drinks, and she's making sure everybody's got chips and dip, and she's making sure that, like, the house is clean, and there's potpourri in the bathroom, and she's doing, I know, exactly what I would do if somebody important was at my house. I would want to take every step necessary to make sure that they felt comfortable and had everything that they needed. And Mary, on the other hand, in my head, Mary is the younger sister. I don't actually know if she is, but I kind of like to think she's the younger sister because she's not doing any of the work. And I know that my younger brother never did any of the work in the house. So in my head, she is. I don't take that. That is not a true fact. I don't know if it's true or not. That's just how I read it. Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. And Martha, she is bold enough to go up to Jesus and be like, hey, Jesus, uh, can you tell Mary to help me out here? Like, I'm doing all this work, hello, I am trying to make this nice for you, and Mary's just sitting on her butt. Like, can you, you know, tell her to get up? And Jesus tells Martha that Mary has chosen what is better. So in this story, we learn a little bit about the relationship between Martha and Jesus and Mary and Jesus. And we learn that they have a trusting relationship. Martha felt bold enough to go and correct Jesus, who she knew enough about to know that he was important, and tell him, please tell my sister to get up and help me. And Jesus had him enough of a relationship with Martha to tell her that she was wrong. And Mary had spent all this time at Jesus's feet demonstrating her love for him. So we know the context of this helps us understand the dynamic between these three people. In addition to that, because Martha and Mary knew Jesus in this context, they also knew what he was capable of. And we see this further demonstrated when we read the scripture and it says that they sent word to Jesus that their brother was sick. They wouldn't have called to Jesus to tell him that their brother was sick if they didn't want him and expect him to do something about it. They said, Jesus, our brother is sick, and they're like, and you can fix it. They called out to him because they had seen what he could do. They believed he was the Messiah, the Son of God, and so they asked him for help. The story continues in verses four through six, and it says, when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days, and then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. Let me ask you this question. Do you ever feel like Martha and Mary in this situation? Like you have a relationship with God, and you have something happen in your life that is unpleasant, or bad, or horrible, or destructive, or devastating. And what you do is what you're supposed to do. You take it to God and you say, God, I believe that you can fix this. I know that you can, you can take care of this. And you submit it to him with the expectation that he will answer you in the way that you expect on the timeline that you have so graciously outlined for him. And then you're like, waiting around. Like, is he just hanging out with his disciples again? Is he ignoring me? I know that I have had that happen in my life, where I have prayed about something and felt like I have submitted it to God with every expectation because I know scripture. I know what I'm supposed to do. So why isn't God keeping up his end of the deal we made here? Like I pray about it, you answer my prayers exactly how I've asked you to. This seems pretty simple to me. Like. I am definitely Martha, just so you guys know, if there was ever any question, I am Martha in every scenario. So for the next few verses, there is some back and forth about when and if they should travel to Bethany to see this family. And eventually, as they're waiting to go back, Lazarus dies. And so Jesus decides that he is gonna go back and visit Mary and Martha while they mourn. 
And at this point, when he arrives in Bethany on the outskirts of town to go see his friends, these people he loves, Lazarus has been dead for four days. So Jesus decided to wait for two days before he came to visit them. And Lazarus has at this point been dead for four days. And what that meant was that he wasn't just dead, he was real dead. And he was in a grave. He'd been wrapped in all his grave clothes. Like, there is no question, Lazarus is dead. He's gone. And that was important for them to know because of what was going to happen later in the story. And at the same time, as Mary and Martha were mourning, Jews from all over the community had come to mourn with them and mourn the loss of Mary and Martha's brother, Lazarus. And we pick up in verse 20 and we read, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Did you see Martha's thought process there? I feel like this is exactly how I would respond if I were encountering the same situation. Like, Martha knows how powerful Jesus is, knows he's the son of God. We see in the second part of that scripture, she knows that even now God will give him whatever he asks. But the first thing she says to him when she greets him is, what were you doing? Where were you? If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. I don't know if she said it like that. That's how I would have said it. But she says, if you had been here, my faith tells me that if you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. My brother would still be alive. She is in despair about the situation she's in. And rightly so, she's sad, her brother's dead. And she knows that Jesus could have prevented her from having to feel that kind of that. But even amidst her grief, she does exactly what Megan and Rebecca have been telling us we need to do. And that is to submit to scripture and remember that God is good even when our situation tells us he's not. Because she says, but even now I know that you can do that God will do whatever you ask. Even though she's saying, if you had been here, if you'd answered me two days ago, none of this would have happened. She knows that that's true, but she knows what is the most truth is that God will give Jesus whatever he asks for. There's even an argument to be made that, Mar that Martha was trying to protect Jesus. She was trying to reason with him. Like, if you had been here, you could have prevented me from having to feel this grief. My brother would still be alive, and none of these Jews would be who are here who are ultimately going to be the ones that tell on you and uh, lead to your crucifixion. Now, Martha didn't know that, but she knew that the Jews who were there weren't particularly fond of Jesus, so she's given him this list of reasons why she is right and why he should listen to her. I know that I am super guilty of that. That when I pray, rather than praying, God, your will be done, I'm like, here's all the reasons why my will is actually the right will. And if you could just get on board with what I want to do and what I think should happen, then this would go a lot easier for me. But when we have that kind of attitude, we miss out on the miracles that God does, the miracles that we see Jesus do in Scripture. And this is the second time we read about Martha in the Bible where she has a little bit of that kind of attitude. In, the, in, in Luke, she's like, hey, Jesus, uh, I don't know if you know this, but you should tell my sister to get up. Sorry to like step on your toes, but you need to. And he's like, no. And this is the second time Martha has this, had this attitude of thinking maybe she knew what was better. And I regularly find myself in this kind of situation where I think that I know what is better, that I need to tell, I need Jesus to tell my friend or my sister what to do because I know better. And then Jesus and Martha have this exchange where she says she knows that Lazarus will be resurrected on the last day. And Jesus tells her that he is the resurrection and the life. And that anyone believing in him will live even though they die. And then he asks Martha if she does believe. And Martha says she does believe that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Jesus is giving her an opportunity to be reminded of who he is, that he has power over death, and that this may not be final for Lazarus. In that moment, he is confronting her with truth. And when we commit ourselves to the study of Scripture, we provide ourselves with the equipment we need to navigate despair and hardship and trial. 
And we see this demonstrated in how Jesus interacts with Martha. And she shows a thorough knowledge and belief and understanding of Jesus, even amidst her struggle. And then we get to verse 28, and in it we read this. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. Now, back in verse 20 of this chapter, we see a description of what happened when word came to their house that Jesus was in town. Martha immediately got up and went to go meet Jesus, which is in alignment with her character. And Mary stayed home, also in alignment with her character. But what we need to know about this situation is that Mary was not just sitting at home. She was sitting at home grieving. The way that it's described in this scripture, what Mary was doing was she was experiencing and expressing a grief so profound that she was likely unaffected by external objects or stimuli. So she either didn't hear that Jesus was coming to, coming to town, so she didn't go meet him, or she was so overwhelmed with grief that she was unaffected by that news. Mary loved Jesus and she trusted him. She sent word to him when her brother was sick but she was so overwhelmed with grief that she had to sit still in that grief and mourn the loss of her brother. Here's what I want you to hear at this point in the story. This is for you. If you find yourself today or someday in the future in a position of grief so profound that you are unaffected, that you are numb, that you are incapable of moving on. I need you to hear this for me this morning, and that is that Jesus is here, and he is asking for you. It was not lost on Jesus that Mary did not come with Martha to meet him on the outskirts of town. He knew the level of grief she was experiencing, and he asked for her. If you find yourself in a position today where you are grieving something, and I imagine that you are because you've lived in this world for this year with me, and I know that I've had plenty of things to grieve this year, you need to know that Jesus is here today and he is asking for you. He is asking for you. So Mary, she gets up quickly as she's kind of called out of this grief and she goes to the outskirts of town to meet with Jesus. She goes out to meet him. And as she, she, she comes up to him and she responds to him the same way Martha does, except for, for her, it's much more dramatic. She doesn't just walk up to him and say, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. She comes up to Jesus and she throws herself at his feet, weeping, wailing, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. I believed in you, Jesus. If you had been here, if you had listened to me, I wouldn't have gotten this diagnosis. I wouldn't have had to go through this trial and this turmoil. If you had been here, if you had been here, this would be different. I wouldn't have to experience this. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like you were doing what you were supposed to do? And for some reason, you weren't getting the result that you thought you needed? the result that you thought you were promised because you believe God is who he says he is, that is where Mary finds herself. She throws herself at, her, at his feet and she weeps uncontrollably. And you know what Jesus does in that moment? He doesn't rebuke her for a lack of faith. He doesn't give her some silver linings like, hey, if you just believed in me, you would know that I'm the resurrection and the life and that uh, I can do whatever I want. God's gonna give me whatever I ask. He doesn't belittle her. He doesn't compare her to her sister and say, well, Martha, you know, she felt this way too, but she still demonstrated belief in me. What Jesus does when he sees Mary at his feet overcome with powerful grief. And he sees these Jews who came with her also weeping with her. He weeps with her. He cries with her. 
He grieves with her. And when he does this, it's a really powerful time that shows us a part of Jesus's character that we don't get to see very often. Jesus doesn't get emotional, like in any way, very often. It is rare for you to see him angry or sad. You see, it's just a rare thing. And in that moment, when he weeps with her, he validates her pain. He substantiates her suffering. He doesn't belittle it. He doesn't say, you need to have more faith that I'm ultimately good. He weeps with her because her pain is fair. And in that scripture, we see something else. We see the comfort in somebody to weep with you. Matthew 5, 4 says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Sometimes comfort comes in the form of someone reminding you about truth you need to hear. Yes, God is good even amidst your pain. God is faithful even though your circumstances don't show you that. He is faithful to you. But sometimes comfort in mourning looks like Jesus weeping with you. And if you find yourself in a position where you have something you need to mourn today, know that he is here and he is asking for you. Not because he wants to teach you something specific or he wants to have a conversation with you, but because he wants to weep with you. And in the next verse, we see that when he sees when he sees Mary weeping and he sees these other, these other Jews weeping too, it says that he is deeply moved. So we know that Jesus is weeping and we read a little bit more about how he was feeling in that moment when it says he was deeply moved. And the word here for deeply moved is a Greek word and it's embry myomai. And you would think that maybe his weeping would show that he was moved by sadness. But that word is most commonly used in other parts of the Bible to describe being moved by anger. Jesus is crying as, as a comfort to Mary, to validate her pain, to let her know that it is acceptable and normal for you to feel this way. But he's also weeping because he's angry. He is angry because this is not how it was supposed to be. He did not create us for grief and pain and death. He did not create Mary to have to experience the death of her brother Lazarus. He did not create us to have to go through the trials that we encounter on a day after day after day after day basis. God created us to enjoy every good thing that he created. He created us to live in perfect harmony and unison with him. He created us for a loving relationship with him forever and sin destroyed that. And Jesus is angry because he is witnessing the destruction that is the result of sin in our world. And he is moved to action because of it. When you are in grief, when you are in pain, Jesus weeps along with you because it is unfair. This is not what he made you for. He did not make you for pain. He did not make you for grief. He did not make you for despair. He did not make you for the grave. He made you for the garden. But because of the destructive nature of sin, we are separated from that perfection. And Jesus mourns that because he's experiencing it himself. And he is angry about it. He is deeply moved. And when he's deeply moved by it, he is moved into action. And he gets up from there and he thanks God that God has given him power over death. That even though we are subject to this world, he is not. He thanks God for that power. He thanks God for that love. And then he goes to the tomb and he says, Lazarus, come out. 
the scripture says that he called out in a loud voice because he was deeply moved and troubled by the fact that sin has separated us from ever, for him from ever. We think that this year has been tough because we've been isolated from our loved ones and it absolutely has. It has made me sad and angry and hurt. Jesus had been separated from us. He has been separated from us. And he's not angry at us about it. He's angry at sin about it. He is angry because death was not supposed to be part of the original plan. He was not supposed to have to do that. We were supposed to be in a, in a relationship with him forever. And he's angry about the, the, the fear and the pain that the people he loves are experiencing. If you are feeling fear and pain, let me tell you this, your grief is not evidence of a lack of faith. Your grief is an appropriate response to the destruction that sin causes in our world. Pain is a normal response. Grief is a normal response and we are not alone in it. We have people to grieve with us like Rebecca talked about. But we also have Jesus who weeps alongside us at the injustice that Satan caused in our world. He weeps with us, he is angry at death and so he overcomes it. He overcomes it when he calls Lazarus out of that grave and then he overcame it on the cross a short while later. When Lazarus came out of the grave, Jesus said, take off the grave clothes and let him go. So even when we feel dead in our sin, even when we feel dead in the things that have happened to us, even when we are numb in our grief because we've experienced an unbelievable personal tragedy, Jesus calls us out of that. The teacher is here and is asking for you. He calls us out of the grave that we were never supposed to live in. And he says, take off the grave clothes. There's one other thing that I wanna point out to you about this story. And it's back at the beginning of the scripture, after, after uh, Mary and Martha had sent word to Jesus about Lazarus, Jesus' response there was, this sickness will not end in death. It's not gonna end in death. Lazarus died. I don't know if you guys saw that part of the story. He died, he actually did. He was super dead for four days in a grave. But that's not how the story ended. That was not the end for Lazarus. Even though it seemed like it was the end for Martha and for Mary, and I'm sure definitely seemed like it was the end for Lazarus, that was not the end of the story. And if you're sitting in one of our locations today and you feel like the season you're, you're in currently is the end of you, you're wrong. This is not the end of your story. Even when you feel like you may be overcome with your circumstances, because in addition to all of the things that we've experienced this year, you have had great personal tragedy in your life. You were not made for the grave that you're sitting in right now. You were not made for the grief that you're in, and that's why you feel it, because you were made for something so much more. You were not made for death and decay. You were made to thrive and to flourish. You were made to care for a perfect garden that God created for you. And he is offering us an invitation to live a life with him where we can experience that. So I think there's things that we can learn from each person in this story. We can learn from Martha that when we need to cling to truth and to faith, we need to go to our scripture. We need to do what Megan said last night and build an arsenal for our faith, build an arsenal for the times of trials that we will experience because we know that they are inevitable. Hate to be the bearer of bad news, but there's gonna be some bad stuff because sin exists. 
And if that makes you mad, well, good, be mad at sin. And work to teach others that. Work to invite them into the faith that you have, the hope that you have. Be like Martha. She gets a bad reputation because of her story in Luke, but in this we see that she is actually demonstrating a really committed faith in Jesus. And if you're in a season where you need to cling to that, go to your scripture. Fill up your arsenal, like Rebecca talked about, that list of statements that come from scripture that she uses when she feels overwhelmed with anxiety and pain and depression and fear and panic. Fill up your arsenal with that scripture. Be like Martha and commit yourself to knowing and believing and living that you are loved by God, that he has power over your circumstances and that this is not the end for you. Maybe you need to be like Mary. Maybe you need to weep. Maybe you need to grieve. And listen, nobody gets to be the judge of how deserving your situation is of grief. Grieve the big things and grieve the small things. And know that when you're grieving, you are not alone. Because in addition to all of the sisters that you have sitting around you, you have Jesus who feels your pain. He weeps with you. And he was deeply moved enough by your pain to not only call Lazarus out of the grave, but to go to his own grave. Because it was never supposed to be this way. We were supposed to be in perfect relationship with him and sin wrecked that, so he did something about it. And maybe you need to be like Lazarus. Maybe you have been in a grave for whatever reason, whether it was your fault or someone else's, I don't care, you're in a grave. Come out of the grave. Take off your grave clothes because this is not the end. This is not how your story gets to end. Your story ends in heaven with Jesus. Your story ends with God's glory, just like Lazarus's did. Whatever you're in right now, this is not the end for you. As I was preparing for this message today, I came across a couple of quotes that I think were really, really powerful. And the first one was in a Bible commentary that I read on John 11, and it says, here was a house, talking about Martha and Mary's house, here was a house where the fear of God was and on which his blessing rested, yet it was made a house of mourning. Grace will keep sorrow from the heart, but not from the house. At some point, sorrow is gonna come to my house. I don't know when, I don't know what kind of sorrow it's gonna be, but I know that it's gonna come to my house. But through Christ, I know that even when sorrow is all around me, even when it's in my house and it's making it personal, that it won't overcome my heart. I know that even though I may be afflicted, I'm not crushed. That even though I may be driven, I may be confused, I'm not driven to despair. I may be persecuted, but I'm not forsaken. I may be struck down, but I'm not destroyed. I know that because I put into practice what we see Martha do. And that is a demonstration of her faith, even when she's in a time of sorrow, because she's prepared for that. I know that because I see it. Even Mary believed, because she went up to him and she said, if you'd been here in her wailing and her weeping, if you'd been here, this wouldn't have happened. Sorrow may come to your house, but it does not have to permeate your heart. And the second quote that I came across, um, the Crossing staff got to attend a, a conference back in September. We attended it virtually, and there was this speaker named Jordan, who's a pastor of a church in New York. And I know a little bit about his personal story because I happen to follow him on Twitter. And um, I've heard, I've, I've read him share about some of this, but he had a really, really sorrowful time when his wife died. He's young, he's in his early 30s, and his wife passed away uh, only a couple years after they got married. And so he is is not unfamiliar with grief. And this is what he said, I cannot celebrate the new reality God has called me to without grieving what I am leaving behind. 
Let me say that again. I cannot celebrate the new reality God is calling to me without grieving what I am leaving behind. Listen, God knows that if he is, if you are leaving something behind in your life, that that is not an easy thing for you. And he does not look down on you for that. He provides you hope and a way through it because he gives us stories like John 11 where we can take refuge in not just the scriptures we've memorized, but the character of Jesus that is presented there. So this morning, if you're here, if you're at Quincy, if you're at Macomb or Kirksville, or you're watching at home and you have never started a relationship with Jesus, you're here and you just came because you wanted to get out of the house and it's crazy times and you were like, whatever, I heard that in Quincy they're having Times Square breakfasts and I'll, I'll be there. If you're here and you've never started a relationship with Jesus because for whatever reason, you're afraid, you're mad at him because bad things have happened in your life, let me just tell you this. Jesus is here and he is asking for you. He is asking for a relationship with you. Your pain, the things that you have experienced your whole life are not unseen by him. He wants you to come to him so that he can grieve alongside you and then do something about it in your life. So if that's you this morning, I want you to know that we have space on these steps for you to space out. And if you, don't want to, if you don't want to come up here and move, then just drop to your knees where you are and let him grieve with you. Because like Rebecca said, there is power when we allow God into our emotions. We don't let our emotions rule us. We let God teach us something through them. And if you're here this morning and you have a relationship with Christ and you're like, why am I still going through trials? Why, do, why is this still tough? Why do I still have doubt? Why do I still have pain? Why do I still suffer? Well, you experience all of those things because we are not yet in heaven. But it is still okay for you to believe and feel pain. It is okay for you to believe who God is, believe that he is as good as he says he is, and for you to still feel pain about the sorrow in your life. But when you commit yourself to his scriptures, when you commit yourself to allowing the Holy Spirit to transform you, that pain, that sorrow, doesn't make it to your heart even when it's in your house. So if that's you this morning, I invite you to come up here and to weep with Jesus. Or maybe you need to come out of the grave. Maybe you've been sitting in it for a long time and you thought you were dead, you're not. You're here today, you're not dead. He's not done with you. This is not how your story ends. And if that's you this morning, if you thought that your story was over because your sin was too big, your past was too, was too wrecked, your life is a mess, you need to come out of the grave and take off your grave clothes because that is not what you were meant for. You were not made for the grave. You were made for for a perfect relationship with Jesus. Would you guys stand and pray with me? Father God, we are so thankful that you give us examples in scripture that are not just perfect, rosy, Pollyanna faith examples, but you give us examples of pain and turmoil because we can take comfort in the fact that we are not alone and that our pain is not, is not an indictment on us. It's just the result of sin in our lives. And God, we praise you that you took the punishment for that sin. That even though we experience the consequences of it here, that we don't have to pay the ultimate price for it. And we praise you that you have provided that for us in our life. I pray for every woman in this room and the rooms that are watching from all over this area. God, I pray that you would do a work in their life so that they could see you more clearly and trust you more fully. I pray that you would move people into a new space in their life. Move them to trusting you for the first time. Move them to believing that their pain is seen and felt and that you have empathy for them in that. I pray that you would call them out of the grave today 
because you have made them for so much more. And I ask all of this in Jesus' name.